Hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and go over section 2.1, which is going to be on functions. So instead of equations, we're kind of moving into functions. And what really is the difference? The thing is, not really that much of a difference. It's just the way that we are now going to label equations when we see them, we're going to call them functions instead. If we kind of think about functions for a second without really diving into the definition, a function is really just going to express or describe the relation between two variables, very similarly to equations. So what is a function? The function goes a little bit further than how equations went before. We now also describe the dependency of one quantity onto another. So we're describing the relationship with the relationship being that one has to be dependent on the other. So we have a few examples here of some real life examples of functions. So for one, height can be a function of your age. Now if you think about it, Every year, you get a year older. Nothing really changes anything about that fact. You have to get older as time goes on. But your height can vary. And it definitely varies between different people, but it varies over time as well. You know, you'll probably grow a lot more, um, like tall-wise, you'll grow a lot taller when you're younger because you're kind of growing into your adulthood. And then once you hit adulthood, you're probably going to stop growing nearly as much, maybe even start shrinking as you get older. Um, so that's kind of what we see in terms of like height. So height really depends on your age and kind of what age you're at. Are you going to be growing because you're young or are you probably going to stay about the same height because you're older? So uh, in, in addition to that, we have temperature as a function of the date. We see that temperatures are usually higher in summer months and then they're lower in winter months. Once again, we're dealing with a, a version of time here, date as a version of time. Time goes on, we can't do anything about that, but the temperature is always going to change and it is dependent on the time of year that we normally see. Then lastly, one that may not be quite as relevant to you, but postage being a function of weight. If you try to, you know, send something in the mail and it's heavy, then it's going to have different, you know, costs attached to it in order to send it. Um, but what we see a lot is that you can't really affect the weight of whatever package that you have, but the price is probably going to change depending on how heavy that package is. So the price is pretty much entirely dependent on how heavy the package is. So we see a lot of these examples where one thing is very dependent on the other. A mathematical example of this would really be that the area of a circle is a function of the radius. However big the radius is, makes your circle bigger or smaller. So the area of your circle is pretty dependent on how big your radius is. So these are the types of examples um, of functions that we're going to see. We're going to see that one thing dependent on another. So for our actual mathematical definition of a function, we see that a function is described as a function f. We will always, almost always, describe functions with f. Um, occasionally, you can see it being described as g or h, but typically we write functions as f or f of x. Uh, so we see a function f is this rule that assigns to each element x in a set a exactly one element, which we call f of x, which is in set b. Now, if you're wondering, if you're thinking of this at all, yes, f of x and y are the same thing. It's just that we use y when we describe equations and we use f of x to describe functions. So whenever you see that f of x, or even if you use a different letter, g of x or h of x, anything along those lines where you see that x is in parentheses with another letter on the outside, that means you have a function of something, a function of x. So that's what we'll normally see uh, when we do problems that involve functions and things like that. So a little bit diving deeper into this definition, we had this thing where we said an element x in set A, your set A is all the possible values of x, all the possible values that would make that function a valid function. And we say that that is the domain. All possible values of x are called the domain. Then we have opposite of that, 
we have the range. The range of f is the set of all possible values of f of x, as x is going to vary throughout the domain anyway. So really, it's the corresponding y values. So when we graph functions, we say that f of x and y are essentially the same. So when you graph values of f of x, you're graphing values of y. So those will correspond to y values on your coordinate plane or on your graph. And your range is all of those possible f of x values, which are completely dependent on the values of x. And we see we have kind of an example here. This is the graph of 1 over x. So our domain covers all possible values of x, so side to side. Range covers all possible values of y, so that up and down. So moving forward with our definition of a function, we refer to the variable in the domain as the independent variable. It's most commonly going to be x, although it can be any number. And the variable in the range is the dependent variable, which is most often going to be y or f of x, or g of x, h of x, whatever it ends up being called. But so we had our independent variable and our dependent variable. So if we say that y is equal to f of x, because they're the same, then x is the independent variable and y is the dependent variable. y depends on whatever x is. That's why pre in previous sections when we created tables of values, we got to pick x and calculate y, because y depended on whatever x was. So that's why we choose to do it this way, and that's why we call x most often the independent variable and y the dependent variable, or f of x. It can be helpful to think of a function as a sort of machine where the input variable or independent variable is the input and the dependent variable is the output. So your function works in the sense that you are going to feed it x and it is going to spit out f of x. Another way you can think of this is if you go to any one of those amusement parks and they have these everywhere, so it's not just amusement parks, but you see those machines where you can place a penny, and usually you have to pay a quarter for it anyway, but you place a penny in a machine, and then you crank it, and it stretches out the penny, and it gives you a new image on your penny. So it flattens out the penny and turns it into something else. That's similar to the way that functions work. Function is that machine. You are handing it the penny, the input, the x value. Then you're going to sit there and you're going to crank the machine and it's going to spit out something new, something different. It is going to spit out f of x, your new penny that has been stretched and has a new picture on it. So that's kind of how your function works. You are feeding it something, it is spitting something else out. And that machine is usually most likely going to be calculated by you. <laughs> and that machine that you're thinking of is the actual function itself. The rule, the machine that we're talking about, this is going to be f of x is equal to x minus one. x minus one would be the machine, be the actual thing that is going to give you a new output. So let's try it out. Example one, we have a function is defined by the formula f of x is equal to x squared plus four. We want to evaluate f of three and f of negative two. So we see here that we don't have f of x. We do have f of x, it is the equation, but we want to evaluate these f of some number. The idea here is that this three and negative two is going to replace x in our formula. So we're going to go ahead and calculate that in our notes. All right, so here we are, example one. We have f of x is equal to x squared plus 4. We want to solve f of 3 and f of negative 2. First, we just want to clarify what this means. f of 3 is telling us that we want to replace x with 3 in f of x Then calculate the value. Same thing for f of negative 2. We will replace x with negative 2 in f of x and calculate the value. 
So for f of three, what we have here is that f of three is equal to f of x, where we've inputted three for x. So if f of x was originally x squared plus four, we're going to replace the x with three instead. So we'll have f of three is equal to three squared plus four. So we see that we replaced x with three in our original equation, our original function. And now we want to calculate this value. We have three squared plus four. Three squared is nine. And nine plus four is 13. So we get that f of three is equal to 13. So now we can do the same thing with negative two instead. So we have f of negative two. We're replacing, remember, the x with a negative two instead. And when we place that negative two, x is squared, which means that we really have x times x. So whenever we have a negative, we need to make sure that that negative is included within that square. So when we put these parentheses, we just want to make sure the negative is inside. So we have negative 2 squared plus 4. And now we can calculate the value. Negative 2 squared is going to be 4. And 4 plus 4 is 8, which means that f of negative 2 is equal to 8. So that would be how we would evaluate a function at specific values. So in this case, we evaluated f of x at 3 and at negative 2. So, all right, let's head on over back to our lecture. All right, so we finished up example 1, and now we can move forward with evaluating a function. So what we just did was evaluate a function at a specific value. So now we're really defining that. When we evaluate a function f at a number, we are substituting the number for the independent variable, essentially the placeholder. So x is just a placeholder for any number. It just means that it's going to sit there until we give it some new number and then find some other value. So x is just a placeholder for you to input any number that you want. Typically, we'll input the value that we want to actually evaluate. So that is what happens when you evaluate functions, which is what we just did in example one. So another example for a function f of x, where it's equal to 3x squared minus 4x plus 7. If we want to evaluate at x equals 2, that means you're evaluating f of 2. And you would replace x with a 2 instead of an x, and everywhere you see an x. So f of 2 would be 3 times 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 7, which that is equal to 11. So f of 2 is equal to 11. So we saw that we replaced every single x with the value that we wanted, x equals 2, just like in example 1. Moving forward with that, we have what's now going to be called a piecewise defined function. So a piecewise defined function is a function that is defined as different formulas for different parts of the domain. So, and it typically looks like what we see here with this big function with the big curly race. So we have some function a of x is equal to, and we have two different functions here. So our main function is defined as different functions on different parts of its domain or graph. So our first one would be f of x. We don't typically know what f of x is, but we would have that normally defined to us. So we say that it has one function between the values of a and b. So between the values of a and b, that function would be valid for x. Then we have two times f of x as our second function for when x is greater than or equal to b. So for all values of x that are greater than or equal to b, you would have a different function defined on your graph. 
So that's what a piecewise defined function is. It's going to be multiple functions defined for different chunks of your graph or domain of that entire function. So, all right, let's go ahead and work a little bit with piecewise functions. For example, two. We see a cell phone plan includes two gigabytes per month for $40, and then it charges $12 per additional gigabyte that you use. So the function of the cost per month is going to be the piecewise function that we have here. We see C of X cost is equal to $40 if X is between zero and two. Remember, X is going to uh, be gigabytes in this case. So if you use anywhere between zero and two gigabytes, that is included in your $40 phone plan. But if you use any more, then two gigabytes, you do have to pay extra. You would pay $12 for every additional gigabyte. So the cost of a phone plan in this case would end up being 40 plus 12 times X minus two. So if you used three gigabytes, you would be paying an extra $12 because you just went one gigabyte over what was already included. So, we have here, we want to find the cost of uh, one gigabyte on our phone plan, two gigabytes, and three gigabytes, because we are evaluating x at the values of one, two, and three. So, all right, let's go ahead and work on this in our notes. All right, so here we are with example two. We have our cost function copied over here again, and we want to evaluate the cost when x is equal to one gigabyte, the cost when x is two gigabytes, and the cost when x is three gigabytes. So we're evaluating all three of these uh, values here for our function. So starting with c of one, remember the one is the gigabyte, it's the value of x. So we're saying that, okay, this month on our phone plan, we used one gigabyte. Well, if we read the problem and we read our equation, we would know that if we use anywhere between zero and two gigabytes, that is included in our $40 phone plan. So if X was equal to one, that would correspond with our $40 phone plan. So our phone plan at the end of the month would be $40. It doesn't matter how much between the values of zero and two that we use, we're always paying $40 until we go over two. So C of one would be $40. Now let's go ahead and do that again here for C of two. Now we probably answer our own question because we just went over this, but we have C of two. We said that it doesn't matter how many gigabytes we use if it's between zero and two gigabytes, our phone plan is always $40. So if X is equal to two, that is between zero and two because we're including two in this specific range here. We have from zero to two and we've included it because we use the inclusive inequality, the less than or equal to, which is that, you know, the side carrot or alligator, however you want to think of it. Uh, it's that side arrow with the line underneath. That means we included that value. So we included two in this first range here, which means that if we had or we used two gigabytes, that is still included in our $40. So our cost function evaluated at two would still be $40. Now, our last one here, we have C of three. So finally, we are out of that range of zero to two. We have three, which is greater than two. So we have your X is equal to three. So we have now fallen into that second functions uh, domain here. X is equal to three. Three is greater than two, which means that we're using this function. So we can go ahead and write this out. 
c of three, we're gonna copy the function and we're just going to replace x with three. So we'll have 40 plus 12 times three minus two. We replace the x with three. And now we can solve this equation here. We've got 40 plus 12 times three minus two. Three minus two is just one. 12 times one is 12. And 40 plus 12 is 52 in specifics dollars. So C of three is $52. So we paid $52 because we used one extra gigabyte. Every extra gigabyte is $12. So 40 plus 12 was 52. So this is how we would go about evaluating for a specific piecewise function. We would first just need to decide kind of in what domain area each one of our values is going to be in. And the corresponding answer is whatever is written there towards the left-hand side. And if we need to actually evaluate something like plugging in X, then we can do that as well. Or if it's just a number without X, the answer is just that number. So, all right, let's head on over back to our lecture. All right, so we just finished up example two here. So we can move on to our next part here. We're still looking at evaluating functions, but now we're looking at evaluating with some different values or different modes of, I guess, math here, <laughs> um, but just different formats instead of think, looking at a piecewise function or just a single function in and of itself. So evaluating another type of function, which we see here is the table of values on our right. But something that goes along with table of values is it's called net change. So the net change in a value of a function of f as your input is changing from values, say, a to b, where a has to be less than or equal to b, that is a requirement of net change, that is always going to be given by the function f of b minus f of a. So you would have two values of x, one that is lower and one that is greater. So A would be the lower value, B would be the greater value. You would evaluate your function for both of those values, A and B, and your net change is calculated by taking your F of B value and subtracting the F of A value. So we're gonna do a problem with this, but also net change is actually an important concept for calculus if you ever move on to calculus. It's also going to come around again uh, a little bit later on in our own semester. So, Back to our table of values here. If we have a table of values for a function, we will see the different function values that correspond to every independent variable value or typically our x values. In this case with the table on our right here, we have a function w and the independent variable is h instead of x, but it all works the same. So what we would see is I would have this table of value where we had defined values of x and also defined values of our function, in this case, w of h. So since we know that the function value is dependent on the value of h, we know that somewhere along the lines, w of h was probably calculated. But if we didn't happen to have a function, we could do things like find the net change. But so this allows us to analyze a function numerically instead of with an equation or graphically if we had it graphed um, or anything like that. So a table of values will allow us to still pull information from a specific function without actually having a function itself. So let's go ahead and do our third example. So we are going to let f of x be equal to x squared. So we have a function now. We're gonna find the net change in our function between the given inputs. For part A, we're going to find the net change from the values of one to three. And part B, we'll find the net change from the values of negative two to two. So all right, let's hand over to our notes to work on this problem. All right, so here we are with example three. We have our function f of x is equal to x squared, and we want to find the net change from 
and we have two parts here. Part A is one to three, and part B is negative two to two. So if we want to find the net change, we'll just really quickly remember what net change is. We say that net change is the formula f of b minus f of a, where a was less than or equal to b. So it's just the formula f of b minus f of a, and then we just have to verify that a is less than b. So for our problem here for part A, we want to find the net change from the values of one, two, three. First thing we want to do is verify what's going to be A, what's going to be B. So in this case, we have the values of one and three. We want A to be the lesser value, B to be the greater value. So one is less than three, which means that one is going to be A, and b is going to be 3. So we could do this a few different ways. We know that net change is going to be f of 3 minus, or sorry, f of 3 minus f of 1, or f of b minus f of a. So let's go ahead and write that out here. f of b minus f of a is going to be f of 3 minus f of 1. Well, we want to know what f of 3 is, and we want to know what f of 1 is. So let's go ahead and just calculate those values separately. So f of, let's start with 1. We're going to plug 1 into our function, replacing x. So f of 1 would be 1 squared, since we're just replacing x. So 1 squared is just going to be 1. So f of 1 is 1. Then we want to check f of 3. And f of 3, remember, we're just replacing x with the value inside parentheses. So we're going to replace x with 3. And we're going to have 3 squared. So 3 squared is equal to 9. So in our function here, where we had f of 3 minus f of 1, we now know that f of 3 is 9 and f of 1 is 1. So really, this function is asking us for 9 minus 1, which 9 minus 1 is 8. So the net change from the values of 1 to 3 on the function x equals or f of x is equal to x squared that value is 8. The net change was 8. So, all right, let's do our next one. We have part B, negative 2 to 2. As always, first part is to evaluate which is going to be A, which is going to be B, then finding the value of f of B minus f of A. I highly suggest pausing at this point, working on the problem on your own, and then playing it again just to make sure that you were correct. But either way, let's go ahead and do it. So, we have negative 2 to 2. We want to know which is the lesser value because the lesser value is a. Negative 2 is less than 2, so negative 2 is a. So we've got a is negative 2, so b is positive 2. Then our net change formula is once again f of b minus f of a. And we've decided that since b is 2 and a is negative 2, this function is really f of 2 minus f of negative 2. So now we, want, now we know what we have to calculate, but we want to know what's f of 2 and what's f of negative 2. So just like before, we're going to replace x with 2 and negative 2 in our function values to find the values of f of 2 and f of negative 2. So let's go ahead and start with f of negative 2. We're replacing negative 2 inside for the x. Now remember that negative is going to go inside the parentheses with the square still being on the outside. So this is equal to negative 2 squared. And negative 2 squared is 4. So now same thing for f of 2 f of 2, we're replacing x with 2, so we've got 2 squared, which is also equal to 4. 
So for our function f of b minus f of a, which is the same thing as f of 2 minus f of negative 2, we would have 4 minus 4. 4 minus 4 is equal to 0. So the net change of this function between the values of negative 2 and 2 was 0. So we saw that these were different values because what the net change is analyzing is the difference in the outputs, the difference in the y values or the f of x values for your function. And what we're doing here is we're picking two separate x values, and then we're seeing how the outputs differ. So in the case of the values between 1 and 3, we saw that the net change was positive and it was larger. Our output for our second x value, 3, was greater than the output of our first x value, 1. We saw it was a value of 8, 8 units of a difference. For part b, since we had negative 2 and 2, we saw that the net change was 0. It just meant that our outputs were the exact same. So really, that's what that means. Our net change may and probably will be different for lots of different x values within a function. So in this case, we saw two different net change values happening for two different uh, values of x on our graph. So that's kind of what we're seeing when we deal with net change. We are analyzing the difference of the outputs. So, all right, let's head back on over to our lecture. All right, so we just wrapped up example three. One other way that can be a little bit more relatable with net change um, is the idea that say you start a business and let's say that in your very first business, you made $500 and you sold a bunch of material. <laughs> and then let's say in your third month, you sold a bunch of material worth about $600. That means that you had a net change of $100. You made an extra $100 between the two time points that you were kind of looking at. We're only comparing those outputs, the how much money we made between those time periods that we were looking at. And the answer was $100. We made an extra $100 between month one and month three. So that's really what we talk about when we talk about net change. We're just doing it in a little bit of a different fashion. But all right, so that was example three. That was net change. Moving on, we have domain of a function. Now, we did go over this in the very beginning of the lecture, and we have talked about it a few times here. We're going to do a little bit more of a deep dive into what a domain of a function is. So we want to recall that the domain of a function is the set of all inputs for that function. So the set of all possible x values, or independent variable values. So the domain is or can be expressed explicitly, meaning that it is given to you entirely, say f of x is equal to x squared, where x is between 0 and 5, including 0 and 5. But if it's not expressed explicitly, the domain of your function is probably just the set of all real numbers for which your expression is also defined as a real number. So that just means that if you do not have an, a, an explicitly expressed domain and the question is not exactly pertaining to like what is the domain of the function, your domain is probably negative infinity to infinity. It is all real numbers. So aka your domain of a function is the all values where your function can actually exist. So there are really only two main cases that we deal in our class where values of a function can't exist. And we'll get into that in our next slide here. Um, but your domain is going to be all values of x where your function exists, which most of the time is most places. But if a function is undefined at a specific value, meaning that your function can't exist at a specific value of x, or in this case, a value of a, your domain would exclude that one value. We'd say its domain is x where x can't equal a, or x does not equal a. And we see that in this notation here. Then if a function is not defined for negative values of x, your domain would be x where x has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if we're excluding 
a big group of numbers like all negative numbers, then we would use an inequality instead of the not equal sign. So we see those kinds of two different ways that we're going to write these. And we can express our domain in interval notation or set builder notation. So what we just saw here in these descriptions, these were set builder notations. And set builder notation is written in these curly braces. You begin by just stating whatever you're talking about, which in this case is always going to be x. So we're talking about x. You would draw a vertical line, and then you would say x has some property. x does not equal a. x is greater than or equal to 0, something along those lines. Um, we will not be using set builder notation. WebAssign does not accept set builder notation. If you see it, this is what it means. This is how you should be reading it. But we will not be using set builder notation. We will be using interval notation. If you just happen to write set builder notation on an exam or something like that, I will most likely give you full credit still because it is correct, but it's just not the notation we're going to use very often. So we will be using interval notation. Interval notation instead is going to give you a specific interval. And fortunately, they look very similar to an ordered pair. So in interval notation, you would have parentheses, a comma in between, and you would say values from A to B. So the interval from A to B. Then we also have here another example. We can include things like infinity or negative infinity to just represent the biggest numbers we can think of or the smallest numbers we can think of. So in this case, we excluded the value of a and we have negative infinity to a. And this symbol right here means a union. It means the union or kind of the glue that would bring these two intervals together to create one big interval. So we would say negative infinity to a and a to infinity. So the union in this case is kind of signifying what we think of the word and. So that's what that union there means. It's just a glue, you know, a little piece of tape to make this one answer instead of two separate answers. But all right, so with the domain of a function, we said that there were really only two ways that we would ever see something kind of mess up a domain of a function. Because almost always the domain is negative infinity to infinity. It is all real numbers. But the two functions where that's not always true is fractions that contain x in the denominator and even root functions that contain x. So starting with fractions, whenever you have fractions, you can never divide by zero. You just can't. That number does not exist. So your fraction can never have a denominator of zero. But let's just say you have a function and x is in the denominator. That means that any value of x that would make your denominator equal zero, that number is excluded from the domain or numbers for that matter, it could be multiple. So an example of this would be like if we had one over x minus one. x minus one, that denominator can never equal zero. So we could take x minus one, set it equal to zero, and we see that x cannot equal one. If x were one, the denominator would be zero. So we have to exclude one from our domain. Our domain would then be negative infinity to one, union one to infinity. So we see that one value got excluded from our domain because it would make our function not exist. We want our function to exist everywhere, everywhere on our domain. So we would have to exclude that one value so we could safely say our function now exists everywhere in our domain. The other function is root functions. And we have to specify even root functions because odd root functions do not count. We say we cannot take an even root, meaning this is a square root, a fourth root, etc. You're mostly going to deal with square roots 95% of the time. You might get an occasional question that has a fourth root, um, 
but you're most often going to be dealing with square roots in this case. So you cannot take a square root of a negative number. You can take a third root of a negative number, so keep that in mind. So really what this means is that if we have a square root, occasionally a fourth root, but mostly a square root, and if anything underneath that square root contains an x, everything underneath the square root can never be negative. Not that x can't be negative. It's the whole statement underneath that square root. So any value that would make that whole statement under your square root negative would have to be excluded from your domain. So something like the square root of 2x plus 4, we would see that x being greater or equal to negative 2 would be in your domain. So any values less than negative 2 could not be included because that whole statement would be negative. And we can't take a square root of a negative number. So if we say that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 2, our domain would be negative 2 to infinity. And since we included negative 2, we would put a square bracket around that instead of a parentheses. So whenever you have that inclusion symbol, you have to include it with a square bracket as well in your domain. All right, so let's go ahead and do our last example. So for example four, we're gonna find the domain of each function. Function a, we've got f of x is equal to one divided by x squared minus four. And for part b, we have the function h of t is equal to the square root of 2t plus 6. So, all right, we're going to go ahead and work on these problems in our notes. All right, so here is our example 4. We have part a is a fraction. f of x is equal to 1 over x squared minus 4. And there's an x in that denominator. So the way that we're going to look at this is that within our fraction, we have 1 divided by a denominator. And our denominator, as we already know, contains x. So our denominator cannot be 0. So we're going to take our denominator, the entire thing, not just x, and we're going to say that it, can, it can't be equal to 0. So if it can't be equal to zero, we have to take the whole entire expression in the denominator and set it not equal to zero. So our denominator in this case is x squared minus four. So we're saying that x squared minus four cannot be equal to zero. And now we wanna solve for x. So we'll solve for x by adding 4 to both sides. So we get that x squared is equal to 4. We want to get rid of the square, and the only way to do that is to take a square root of both sides. So we'll take the square root of both sides. And we'll get that x is equal to, and if we take the square root of 4, we get the value of two. But we know that if we square negative two, we also get the value of four. So when we take the square root of four, the answer is two, but it is also negative two. So we're gonna put this little symbol in front of it. It's plus or minus two, meaning that it can be positive or negative two. But really what this means is that x is equal to negative two and x is equal to positive two. That's what that means. So we've determined that x, it cannot, I missed the cannot, I kept writing equal sign, can't, 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 there we go. So <laughs> x cannot equal positive or negative 2. It can equal any other number in existence, though, just not a negative 2 and not positive 2. We're going to scroll this down a little bit. So what we're going to do, since we want to exclude these values. And we're going to write our answer in interval notation. So something that's going to help us is drawing a number line. So if we draw a number line, our number line represents numbers from negative infinity to infinity. 
And let's just say, you know, zero is right there. We can't include negative two and two in our domain. So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna put negative two and two on our number line. It doesn't have to be exact. They just have to look, you know, where they should go. So on less than zero, we're gonna put our negative two. And on bigger than zero, we're gonna put our two. There we go, looks about right. So for our number line here, we have the values of negative two and two. And we know we cannot actually include those values. So when we write out our domain, everything gets included except for those values. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw circles around those notches. We're saying we can't include them, but we would include every value other than them. And then we wanna go ahead and we're gonna kind of draw out the visual representation of what our domain should be. <clears throat> everything less, whoa. Everything less than negative two. Everything greater than positive two. And everything in between. So this is our domain. Everything except negative two and two. So when we write out our intervals, we're gonna have three separate intervals. We have everything less than negative two, everything greater than positive two, and everything in between. So we're gonna write these three intervals. So first one being negative infinity to negative two. So we wrote parentheses also because we are not including those values. So when you don't want to include a value, you would put parentheses. Infinity and negative infinity always get parentheses. They never get anything else. But so we want to exclude negative two, so we give a parentheses. Then the one in the middle, negative two to positive two. And our last interval here, everything greater than two. So we would have two to infinity. So our domain consists of three separate intervals, but these three intervals represent our entire domain, which means that they need to have unions. So, oh geez, there we go. Okay, so now that we have those three intervals, They've been written out, we've excluded the values of negative two and two, and they all have unions. That would be our final answer for our domain. So that is our domain in interval notation. So, that wraps up part A. So whenever you see fractions, you are excluding values. You're excluding single values normally. So now on to part B. Part B was that other version that we saw that kind of messed up domain. This is square roots or an even root function, but it's almost always square roots. So we have a square root of 2t plus 6. And we want to remember the key here for square roots, and it's that anything under the square root cannot be negative. So we can say we have the square root of just really anything, the square root of something. So that's what we're going to write, square root of something. And the idea here is that that something, whatever it is, has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's how we would typically write like not negative. We would say greater than or equal to zero. It can be zero, it just cannot be anything less than zero. So when we look at our problem here for part B, we have that something. That something is 2t plus six. So when we write this out, we wanna take 2t plus 6 
and we're saying that it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And now we want to solve for this inequality. So we have 2t plus 6 greater than or equal to 0. We're going to go ahead and we're going to subtract 6 from both sides. We want to solve for t. So we subtract 6 from both sides. We get 2t greater than or equal to negative 6. Now, for solving for t, we want to get rid of that 2. We're going to divide each side by 2. So then we get that t is greater than or equal to negative 3. This is our statement that we have to work with. t has to be greater than or equal to negative 3, which means that it can be negative 3 or greater, and that's it. So just like before, we're going to go ahead and draw out our number line. So here's our number line. Let's say zero is about right there. Here's negative infinity and infinity. So negative three is probably eh, somewhere around, you know, right here. And then we're gonna draw out our domain. We're saying that our domain has to have values of negative three or greater. So whereas before when we could not include those values like in part A, we can include negative three. So we're gonna put a big filled in dot at negative three. We can include it. And we can include anything greater, which means anything bigger than negative three. Zero, one, two, ten, a thousand, anything like that. So our function begins at negative three and goes greater. So this is the function that we're looking at at this point. And so we're going to write out our interval. Unlike before, this is just one big interval. We don't have pieces of intervals that need to be um, stuck together with unions. We just have one big interval. And this one big interval begins at negative 3. And it goes to infinity because it's really any larger number all the way up to, uh, all the way up to infinity. And whenever we write infinity, we always give it uh, parentheses, but we've included negative three. We write parentheses when we don't want to include a specific number, but we want to include negative three, which means that we would give it a square bracket instead. So our domain for this problem is a negative three to infinity, including negative three. Now, if you were wondering why we never actually include infinity, we always write parentheses. It comes from the idea that infinity is not a real number. It's an idea. It's an idea of the largest number we can ever think of, you know, times 100 plus 100. You know, numbers always get bigger or smaller. Uh, for infinity. So infinity is an idea, not an actual number, which means you can't actually include it, which is why we always write parentheses around negative infinity and infinity. So there we have it. Two different types of domains, the two main um, types of functions and operations that we will have um, that really give us funny looking domains <laughs> and make us do a lot of extra work. So, all right, that wraps up example four here. So let's go ahead and head back over to our lecture. All right, we just wrapped up example four. Just one quick last slide here. We just have four ways to represent a function. We have seen almost all of these so far in this section, or at least also within our last section here. But we can describe any function in the four following ways. We can describe it verbally, meaning in a word problem, we can describe it algebraically by using a formula, like what we see over here, verbal, algebraic. We can do it visually by using a graph or numerically by using a table of values. So some functions are expressed in all four ways and some functions can be expressed all four ways and they're great either way. 
but sometimes most functions are best described by just one method or another, as opposed to some other ways. Um, but so just going to say that sometimes functions are best described using specific types of ways that we can actually um, describe them and sometimes not. So if you don't have an equation, probably a table of values is pretty good if you don't actually have an equation because you still have all the different values for x and y or x and f of x, even if you don't have an equation. If you have an equation, then algebraic is probably the best way to go. Visual is also really good. And verbal is usually something that's there to give you a headache. So you would get, you know, a word problem and then you'd have to turn it into an algebraic or a visual or numerical way of representing that function. Almost nobody actually uh, likes verbally the best. <laughs> um, although it's not too bad once you have an immense practice with it. But all right, those are just four ways we represent functions. You've seen them all, you're going to continue seeing them all. And these are just us, you know, actually giving them names and describing it. But all right, in summary, that finishes up section 2.1. So from section 2.1, we learned about what a function is, how to evaluate them, how to identify their domain, and the four ways we actually represent functions. So all right, that finishes up this section, and I'll see you in the next one.